for joining the afternoon session. Uh, then I would like to introduce our the first uh, speaker, the Prashant uh, Kamat, uh, Professor Kamat. And Professor Kamat is a lab John A. John CSC, Professor of Science in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and Radiation Laboratory at the University of Notre Dame. He has published more than 400 scientific papers that has, has been well recognized by the scientific community. And Thomson Reuter has featured him as one of the most cited researchers uh, each year uh, during 2014 to 2022. He is currently serving as the editor-in-chief of Asia's Energy Letter. Please welcome the Professor Kamat. Okay, uh, uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to join uh, this uh, webinar series, and it's a great pleasure uh, to be with uh, all of you today. Uh, and nice thing about virtual seminar is you can be in any part of the world, uh, even while traveling. So actually, uh, I am in India right now, and uh, so that's how I have to select this time. Uh, I will start off... Uh, uh, my talk, giving you just a broad perspective uh, on the uh, renewable energy and then uh, uh, especially the perovskite solar cells. And uh, the work is supported by uh, U.S. Department of uh, Energy. Uh, one of the things that happened in the last decade uh, is uh, uh, three important things. Again, it's from my perspective. Uh, one of them is uh, the surge in wind and uh, uh, solar as a cheaper energy alternative. Uh, by 2030, uh, renewable energy will be one of the major source of energy, uh, surpassing uh, coal and natural energy, uh, natural gas. Uh, so uh, again, throughout the world, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, promotion of these activities, and uh, again. Given the climate change, uh, this is becoming more and more uh, an important contribution. And goes along with is the storage batteries. Uh, the prices are dropping, and uh, newer techniques are coming. And uh, so uh, as a result, now we are thinking about using a grid storage. So if you generate a lot of energy, you can do a grid storage of these uh, uh, through the storage batteries. And the third and most important thing uh, that we sort of overlook is the revolution of uh, LED lighting. And this LED lighting uh, is such that uh, it is reducing our energy consumption. So energy saved is energy gain. So especially uh, countries like India and uh, Brazil and uh, some other developing countries, uh, this is becoming a big uh, savior uh, in uh, reducing the load on the grid. Uh, so I think this is uh, uh, an important area that we should recognize as part of a major uh, change that occurred in the last 10 years. Okay, now coming back to the solar cells, uh, especially uh, thin film solar cells. Uh, in 90s, we started with disensitized solar cells and they were about 10 micron thick. Uh, and it involved electrolyte. From that, we moved on to solid state uh, DSAC, uh, and then extremely thin absorber cell or the semiconductor quantum dot solar cell. And from there, we moved to perovskite solar cell. It's essentially similar architecture that involves a mesoscopic oxide film and covered by a uh, light absorbing material. Uh, in this perovskite, we have these metal halide perovskites, and then we have a hole transport layer and an electron transport layer that drives these electrons in the uh, charge carriers in the opposite direction. And uh, we have received gained efficiencies uh, significantly. And uh, so uh, uh, we can uh, now get uh, as high as. Uh, uh, with the perovskite silicon tandem solar cell over 32 percent and the perovskite solar cell over 25 percent. So this is coming close to the silicon uh, solar cell uh, efficiency. Uh, but uh, still, uh, again, here is some information on lead halide perovskite. You can, most of you may know. I just want to give you an idea that uh, these are ABX3 crystal structures. 
and uh, then in this cavity you can put either cesium, methyl ammonium or formamidium and that sort of gives that perovskite structure and only these three ions can be accommodated uh, in this uh, uh, cavity. Uh, others are too small or too large but recent efforts have shown that you can uh, dope these materials with other cations and get a better uh, structures and better performance uh, in this case. Uh, although you are trying to make 25 or over 25 percent cells, uh, in the panels it comes down uh, and it's very difficult to compete with an existing silicon solar cell market. So one of the idea is to, if you cannot win the race, why not you join the race? So it's creating tandem. So basically, if you give a layer of uh, perovskite on the top of a silicon solar cell, the high energy photons are first absorbed by perovskites and then by silicon solar, uh, silicon layer. And this way, uh, one can achieve uh, quite high efficiencies uh, in this. Again, there are uh, four junction cells or two uh, junction cells uh, they have been studying uh, quite efficient. Uh, here is the latest on all halide tandem cells and in which they created a wide band gap perovskite and a near, narrow band gap perovskite and then they combined the two and uh, along with the ALD uh, deposited tin oxide and a whole transport layer. So uh, with that, they were able to capture up to 27% uh, PCE. So uh, uh, this is uh, just out uh, in nature. Okay, so that is great. Uh, we are getting uh, very high efficiencies. But when it comes to the long-term stability issues, uh, this is seems to be uh, still uh, a major hurdle or need to overcome. Uh, people people uh, uh, who are in uh, working in this area are uh, able to get up to 1,000 hours, 2,000 hours uh, with a minimal degree. And then, uh, but if you want to have it for a practical device, you need to have much larger um, uh, time span. And one of the things early on uh, it was identified is what they call um, hysteresis. That means when you are recording these JV curves, uh, there is a reverse bias when you go in, and when you come back with a forward bias, there is a hysteresis. Uh, that, and this was attributed to this ion accumulation at the electrode, uh, creating a capacitance and then just being more resistive. And uh, however, people have found out uh, ways to make uh, better cells and get rid of this history uh, by adding uh, different components or making a better electron transport and pole transport layer and other uh, techniques. So this is not an issue anymore, but this just points out one small thing is uh, this ion mobility, especially halide ion mobility in this solar cell is an important uh, thing. And uh, here it is uh, uh, correlation between immobilizing ions and uh, suppressing hysteresis, uh, uh, one of the early studies on this one. Uh, we looked into the mixed halide perovskites very early on, uh, this is in 2017, where we showed that if you make a cell with just a plain mixed halide perovskites, these ions move, um, move uh, and they segregate the and as a result you can see here a decrease so in the performance of the solar cell and, and again i'll be coming back to this uh, segregation effect but again this is because of the movement of the ion so it does matter in the performance of the solar cell okay so in today's talk i will uh, focus on three different aspects one is visualizing the halide ion mobility how we can see it uh, uh, and how we can characterize and obtain some information. And uh, the second point is what makes this halide ion mobile under photo irradiation. Uh, and in the, uh, the last one is uh, 3D versus uh, 2D perovskites and then how, again, uh, some of the new uh, results that come out from our lab. Okay, first look under uh, how we can see this halide and mobility. It's a very simple experiment. You put uh, films of methyl ammonium lead iodide and methyl ammonium uh, lead bromide on two different slides, glass slides. 
and just put together like a sandwich fashion and clamp them and put it on a hot plate. And you come back after three or four hours and you open up and they are same color, both of them. That means the bromide has moved to the iodide side and iodide has moved to the bromide side. So this clearly shows that there is an exchange of ions uh, in this one. So although they are solid films, these ions are mobile. And uh, again, we can track through the uh, spectroscopy. So this is the first one with the bromide side, and then this is the iodide side. They, remember, there are two slides in this one. They are separate. One is bromide and one is iodide. And as you heat up, and with time, this iodide peak shifts to the uh, more higher energy, and the bromide peak shifts to the more lower energy, giving you this mixed halide peak. And we can track the decrease or the shift, and you can get a kinetics of uh, this information. And uh, this is again showing you the, how the EG peak shifts uh, in this direction. And uh, this is a difference absorption spectrum that I shown based on this one. So we can get kinetic information. So how does this rate constant of ion migration change with the temperature? So here is a collection of data. So we just monitor the absorbance of 523, that is a decrease in the bromide uh, peak. And at room temperature, there is very little change, uh, very slow change. Whereas as you go into like even 60 degrees, you start seeing a disappearance of uh, this bromide peak. And as you reach about 120 degrees, uh, you can, uh, within like a uh, couple of hours, uh, you can uh, make them homogenize. Uh, in the same composition. And we can get the rate constant, we can fit to the first order rate constants and uh, get an Arrhenius plot, that is log K versus one over T. And from the slope, we can calculate the activation energy that is involved in the mixing of it, uh, the two ions and to give you composition. So in short, what happening is in the dark, they like to be together in a mixed composition. That is the entropy of mixing. And uh, now comes the light irradiation. So an entirely opposite phenomenon we see uh, uh, in the, when you shine with a steady state light. And when you put this extra energy into these uh, uh, mixed halide perovskites, what you see is a, uh, they get space segregated. What would like to be together in the dark, now they wanted to be separate, uh, two different uh, species. And that's why you get these uh, domains of uh, bromide-rich and iodide-rich domains. So, but when you turn off the light, they will revert back to the original com mixed halide composition. So in light, they want to be separate. In the dark, they want to be together. So that is the summary. And now we'll see how we can monitor this. So this is a mixed halide film, and you take it and you shine the light. And first thing you see is the peak of this mixed halide peak goes down, and the iodide peaks goes up. Same way, the emission goes down of the mixed halide, and the iodide emission comes. Note that there was no bromide emission peak. So we can again do the intensity dependence and study and other things. Uh, uh, here. So uh, again, we followed the change in the absorbance. And again, you see here, this is the difference absorption spectrum uh, from the previous slide, uh, this peak, these two peaks here. Uh, this is decreasing and this is increasing. So this is shown in a more clear way in the difference absorption spectrum. So one is going down and another is coming up. So we can follow this absorbance and plot over time and get the kinetics of segregation under these conditions. Again, I have to caution you, this rate constant to measure are sensitive to the light intensity uh, and the uh, type of composition you have. Uh, again, we can do the Arrhenius plot and get an activation energy about 29 uh, kilojoules per mole. And uh, so this is for this one. So how to consolidate the two so what I've told you is uh, there is an activation energy in the both processes. So the preferred uh, 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 phase is the mixed halide phase in the dark, but only when you put light that is an extra energy that needs to overcome this uh, barrier 
And in addition, there is also another barrier. So here we can write the K forward, that is to segregate is proportional to the difference between the EA reverse and EA delta E light. So this one needs to compensate for the uh, mixing of the two. So as a result, what you see is a threshold energy for each temperature. Uh, and here it is. So with increasing temperature, we need more light energy because otherwise there is a driving force also increases for the um, mixing. So again, this summarizes uh, sort of a both uh, the dark mixing versus uh, light in the segregation. Okay, so this is a property again associated with the halide ion migration. So now the question is, what is the origin of this thing? Uh, photo induced halide ion modulation. So uh, one of the things early on proposed was there are two state model. That is in the dark, there is only one state and there are two potential wells in the light. So that's why they get stabilized. This is a very simple uh, explanation. There's also another explanation given was a uh, uh, polaronic strain model uh, where uh, because of the light, uh, this uh, lattice gets strained and they kick out this iodide and that moves on. Uh, and then uh, again, uh, both theoretical uh, predictions and our own experiments show that that hail defects are very important to see this migration of ions. So this is a defect assisted uh, halide segregation. Uh, it was proposed because you need those uh, vacancies to make these ions move quite effectively. So another interesting fact was I mentioned earlier, when you segregate, you start seeing iodide emission and there is very little bromide energy. So the reason is uh, uh, this conduction band of this uh, bromide, mixed halide or iodide, they are isoenergetic. That means the electrons can move across uh, this uh, uh, band very freely. And that's mainly because it is uh, dictated by 60 levels of uh, lead. Whereas the valence band is dictated by the P levels of halide. So since the halide composition changes, the valence band changes, and we see uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide in this case is the lowest band gap material in this one. As a result, all these charge carriers generated, doesn't matter where, they come here and accumulate and recombine. And in fact, we have done our picosecond laser flash study, uh, sorry, femtosecond studies to show uh, this kind of a uh, migration of holes to this uh, iodide occurs at the time scale of uh, about 100 to 200 picoseconds. Uh, so with that in mind, so what I've been telling you is when you shine the light, essentially these holes accumulate at the iodide rich phase. And this is what we uh, consider as the driving force for making uh, this iodide. So in the next few slides, I will show you how we prove this whole accumulation is leading to this iodide migration. And uh, so for example, we did uh, two separate experiments, different from the steady state photography. One is a uh, laser pulse uh, excitation. Uh, in this case, what happens is if you have uh, a perovskite film coated on a glass slide or a insulating layer like a zirconium oxide, the charge carriers that you generate are recombined. Any segregation that occurs are recovered back in the dark cycle. As a result, when you put this pulse laser, uh, you don't see any segregation. Whereas if you have a electron transport layer like TiO2, the electrons move quickly into TiO2, and if you have oxygen, they can take away these electrons. So leaving excess holes in the perovskite. So that is the strategy, and we wanted to see whether that can induce segregation. In the other case, we use electrochemical modulation. That means we can either pull out the electron or inject holes uh, into this system and see what kind of changes we see. Again, this is a totally different way to inject holes by electrochemically to prove our point. Uh, here, uh, this uh, uh, shows you what happens when you have this pulse laser on a uh, methyl, uh, uh, metal halide perovskite. In this case, 
Uh, it is uh, methyl ammonium, lead, bromide, iodide, with 50-50 composition, uh, deposit on a TiO2 and in the presence of air. And what you are seeing here is spectrum A is changing to spectrum B. And you can see it's very similar segregation as you see in the steady state photography. We can also follow the emission and emission decays and the iron emission layers. There is a small bromide too in this case we were able to see. And one can follow the emission intensity and get the kinetics. And you can see here <coughs> how uh, the emission grows in this case. Uh, and then uh, what we did was we did a transient absorption and we recorded absorption five picosecond after the base will fall while it is continuously uh, uh, irradiating with the pulse laser. And uh, here you can see uh, in the case of TiO2 air, uh, this one starts going down the mixed halide peak and the bromide peak and bleach and the iodide bleach are increasing. These are essentially the excited state of bromide and uh, iodide phases. And as they are generated, this uh, iodide-rich and bromide-rich regions, they also get excited. And as a result, we see the bleach uh, in this case. And uh, if you do on a zirconium oxide, we don't see anything close to it, but small decrease. And this decrease could be due to uh, uh, expulsion of iodine uh, from the surface uh, in the laser excitation because you can see the shift in the uh, peak, uh, bleach peak uh, in this case. In any case, we can follow this TiO2 and get the kinetics of uh, this segregation. So we also did another experiment. So what happens if you put a whole transport uh, like spirometer? And we put it on the TiO2 layer here, and then uh, we saw the electrons and holes are now being scavenged, and there is no accumulation uh, in the perovskite uh, uh, film. So what we see when you see this bleach, uh, again, the same experiment before, if you don't have the spirometide, the mixed halide phase recovers very quickly to generate the iodide and bromide rich, whereas if you put a spirometide, we don't see uh, that kind of a behavior. So it again points out that the whole accumulation is the one that is resulting in the phase segregation and not the, uh, doesn't happen if you have a nice uh, hole. And the thing that is important here is in a perovskite solar cell, while designing your electron transport layer and hole transport layer, you should take precaution that both are pulled out at the same rate to maximize the performance. If one of the rates goes down, uh, then you need accumulation of the opposite charge. And as a result, uh, you can see the decreased performance. Again, this one uh, thing is uh, just uh, in a zirconium oxide, uh, we don't see that uh, behavior uh, in air uh, compared to the, this one. This is, again, is showing you here uh, the schematic diagram and you excite it. Uh, if you block the electron transfer uh, or if you, uh, then they recombine and there is no accumulation. Uh, if you transfer the electron and scavenge away with the O2, then you start seeing segregation. Okay, uh, then there is another aspect of it. Uh, is if you take this uh, halide film, again, you can see this uh, movement of uh, halide ions uh, by doing a spectroscopy measurement. So we took this film, uh, deposited uh, on a glass slide and shine light in the presence of a DCM. In the dark in DCM, this film is stable, but under light, what you see is a shift in the absorption peak indicating the expulsion of iodine. We have monitored the solution and we can see the I3 minus coming out in the forming in the solution. And what we see is you see up to bromide. Uh, this one. So, to summarize, what we are seeing here is in a mixed halide film, when you shine the light, there is a phase segregation first, and the iodide comes to the grain boundaries. And if it is in contact with the DCM, the iodide gets expelled, leaving behind bromide. So it's a, uh, again proves the point that is the iodide is the one that's collecting the holes, getting oxidized, and it starts hopping to defect sites, come to the grain boundaries, and then it is forming I2, and then maybe grabbing an I minus from the surface to make it I3 minus. Uh, 
We can also modulate this expulsion of iodine by controlling the bias. So this is a case where you make it more uh, uh, positive uh, potential bias and the electrons are taken away more efficiently, leaving more accumulation that leads to the oxidation of iodide. And you can see here the dependence between minus 0.3 and plus 0.5. At this potential, there is no change in the chemistry of this halide as such. It is only because it only happens only when you shine the light, this iodide comes out. Otherwise, it is stable on these potentials. And uh, so again, we can measure the expulsion rate versus the potential. And you can see here the dependence has become more negative. Now you are putting more electrons back into this uh, material and uh, you are changing this Fermi level making the whole accumulation less probable. As a result, you see a very decreased rate. So again, it points out to the fact that the whole accumulation on the iodide is responsible uh, for uh, uh, the movement of the halide. We also did electrochemistry. Again, these are the cyclic voltammograms, And you can see here with increasing bromide, the peak shifts to the more positive because the bromide is difficult to oxidize than the iodide and mixed halides are somewhere in between. And we also tested first in DCM, it is stable for uh, three to four hours. And uh, here is the region where we probe. This is the region where you accumulate elect uh, holes in the valence band when you apply about 0 0.8, 0 0.9 volts. And we applied that volt and saw very similar behavior what we saw in photoradiation, that is expulsion of iodide into the solution and uh, it indeed leaves bromide. So the, all the iodide comes out leaving behind bromide and you can pictureize this one to this uh, uh, actual photographs. This is what we start off with mixed halide and then it becomes intermediate state and then finally it leaves with the bromide in this one. Uh, interestingly, the, it also changes the defects and the, uh, other recombination. So we can follow, uh, this is the, uh, bromide and iodide emissions uh, that we see uh, before and after bias, the red and the blue. So this is before bias and this is after bias. So there is a change in the excited state. So to summarize, the mixed halide forms, you inject holes, uh, you form this phase segregation and eventually leads to this uh, segregation. So, so uh, there is a recently uh, a very random group have published a, uh, a dual perspective identifying this, how halide chemistry dictates uh, the performance of the solar cell. And again, this iodide gets oxidized. It is again trapping of the holes and uh, the oxidized iron uh, diffuses and then iodine is re-reduced and re-enters into the perovskite lattice. And again, the cycle continues. Uh, so uh, to summarize uh, again, the whole trapping in halide perovskite induces uh, phase segregation. Um, so uh, this is a uh, accounts of material research article uh, that we recently published. And uh, so uh, you please take a look at it uh, for uh, the so far doing this. So now the question comes, what about 2D perovskites? Uh, the 2D perovskites have been recognized as more stable than the 3D. Uh, and these are 2D, and you can make them, even crystallize them, this uh, perovskite uh, crystal, just to show you N equal to 1 with the butyl ammonium as a spacer cation, and uh, uh, this iodide, and you can redissolve it, uh, make films, and characterize, and those things. So how you make it is uh, you just change the ratio of your spacer cation and uh, uh, your methyl ammonium cation uh, ratio. And that gives you uh, different layers. Uh, for example, if you're 3D and you add a little bit of, uh, uh, in a controlled fashion, uh, change the ratio between methyl ammonium and uh, phenylethyl ammonium cation, and uh, you start uh, uh, separating out these layers. Uh, when you have 100% uh, PEA, uh, then you get N equal to 1. And when you are 33 to 66, you get N equal to 2, et cetera. So the interesting point here is the sharp excitonic peak that you see for N equal to 1, 2, and 3. And beyond N equal to 6, uh, it behaves more like a bar. And as it is evident from 
uh, this uh, plot of binding energy is number of layers. And you can see here after about uh, six to 10, uh, there is no change uh, in the binding energy. So they behave more like a bulb. And people also call them as more like a quasi, uh, quasi 2D material. But most interesting is in this earlier, less than six, uh, I think. Um, uh, we wanted to see whether even 2D mixed halide perovskite uh, undergo phase segregation. And to our surprise, uh, it is, uh, especially if you have a butyl ammonium uh, lead uh, bromide iodide, uh, it is more uh, crystalline. It depends upon the spacer cation. The organic uh, uh, core of the spacer cation suppresses uh, uh, this process, whereas if you have alkyl chain, it's more prominent. So here you can see the change in that uh, n equal to one absorption peak going down uh, when you shine the steady state light. And this is a different absorption spectrum showing the formation of bromide and iodide region. Uh, again, what I also see is the emission. Uh, this is the very weak emission from the uh, mixed halide around 475 nanometers or so, and now it shifts to the iodide-rich region of this emission. And we can follow this emission region or the decrease in absorbance, and we get very similar rate constant. So this 2D halide perovskite also behaves same as 3D. And interestingly, uh, there have been a lot of push, uh, if you read the literature on perovskite solar cell, is to deposit a 2D layer on a 3D layer. And uh, everyone sees, uh, you can see here, it's a very stable performance uh, for 2,000 hours. Uh, and they also show how nicely they can lay down this 2D layer on a 3D. Uh, so again, uh, there are several uh, papers claiming that uh, uh, if you put 2D layer on a 3D thing. Uh, the question uh, that arises is how stable is this 2D layer? Is it the 2D layer or is it something, the organic cations that is sort of causing this one or a quasi 2D phase? So that is a debatable question. For example, in the literature, there are uh, several papers showing that these spacer cations are dynamic. They diffuse into the 3D. And uh, this needs to be most of the time in the thermal, uh, various uh, people have used the strategies to detect uh, this kind of a movement of ions. So now the question is how stable 2D, 3D interface under photo radiation? This is a very simple question and a very simple question. So what we did was we took a 3D layer, exchanged the spacer cation and created a, a small 2D layer on the top of it. Again, we followed the same recipe as people use it for making solar cell uh, so performance better. Uh, and uh, so you can see here, if you take an absorption spectrum, there is a 2D phase that's coming in here. And uh, then uh, when you shine the light, this decreases. Uh, this is the emission spectrum of the same 2D, 3D cell. They are characteristically separated. There is no energy transfer in this case you see uh, characteristic peak of 3D and 2D. But when you shine the light for about three hours, the 2D peak totally disappears. And there's a small change in the 3D, uh, that's maybe because of uh, uh, movement of these cations and there is a small shift in the blue shift too. Uh, we can follow this absorption change under light. Uh, and you can see here, uh, uh, this decreases. This 2D peak that decreases. This is shown in the absorption here. The bleach, the difference absorption increases. And we can follow and get the kinetics and other things. More interestingly, if you do a uh, transient absorption to uh, follow the uh, carrier lifetime, you see that after putting uh, this uh, uh, 2D layer, uh, they become better, but even after irradiation, it doesn't change. So, uh, it agrees with what people have seen that uh, these kind of putting 2D layers improves the performance. Even after uh, shining light, it doesn't change. It removes very into the condition. Uh, so what about heating? Very same effect. You see here this 2D peak decreasing and emission decreasing of the 2D layer. So essentially what is happening is these cations are migrating to this bulk phase and we are not there is no more 2D there. Uh, it could be a quasi-2D. 
uh, so here it is uh, the uh, room temperature. You can follow these changes at different temperature and you can get a, 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 a activation energy and uh, for this process. Interestingly, we also did the uh, XRD of this film before and after radiation. This is characteristic 3D peak and 2D peak, and you can see here before irradiation, both these peaks appear, and when you heat it uh, 3D, uh, your 2D peaks are disappeared. So again, it's confirming that uh, under light or heat, the 2D that you initially put on the 3D is not stable. It is the cations migrate, and it is a more quasi 2D than what you uh, thought earlier. So the suggestion is initially put on the 3D is not stable. It is the cations migrate, and it is a more quasi 2D than what you uh, thought earlier. So the suggestion is initially put on the 3D recently, where they just deliberately added organic cations. Uh, and uh, so they can do uh, these uh, uh, studies and ensure that the stability of 2D interface needs to be checked after prolonged cell operation. Uh, again, and so they reduce PCSC stability. It is not the 2D layer, it is the intercalating cations that is making. So now the question is, is it 2D, 3D, or quasi 2D that improves the PSC performance? So this this is something to think about, and uh, uh, so uh, with that, I would like to summarize uh, what I showed so far. Uh, in the halide migration, uh, dictates the performance of metal halide perovskite uh, devices. Again, this is an ongoing uh, issue, and people are coming up with various uh, treatments and uh, removal of surface defects uh, to improve the performance. But even if it is a very small fact, uh, fraction of this. Uh, process remains, it can create this one. We also showed that the iodine that's coming out can come out of this uh, material under light or heat. Uh, again, it may be a very small fraction, uh, uh, thousand of a percent efficiency, but still uh, it can cause long-term damage. Uh, under light irradiation, these 2D and 3D, both of them undergo phase segregation. In the dark, they would like to be in the mid state, but in the thing. So the case we studied 50-50 was sort of an extreme case just to see how these ions move. In a practical device, these are greatly suppressed because the, when you put triple cation or other compositions, they are much, much suppressed. The case I am presenting here is just to demonstrate how we can monitor these uh, changes under extreme conditions. Uh, and when in contact with DCM, this oxidized iodine comes out of the solution, again showing a redox chemistry of iodine plays a major role in perovskites. And uh, the, finally, I showed you the trapping of holes uh, is uh, responsible uh, for this one. And there are some papers that are listed here uh, for those who are interested in knowing more, uh, you can follow this too. And finally, I would like to thank uh, our, uh, this is our uh, latest uh, uh, group uh, picture. Uh, we have a very small group, but uh, very productive. And uh, we always look for more challenges. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, let us know. And I'll be very happy to answer. And uh, since uh, I have been introduced as the ACS Energy Letter Editor-in-Chief, I would like to just uh, show you that uh, uh, we welcome uh, contributions from all of you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Kama, for very impressive presentation. Uh, now time is open for question. Uh, we have the one uh, question. Uh, you, you can also find the this question in Q&A. So among uh, the mentioned methods to increase stability on the light, which one is the most efficient direction on the light irradiation? Yeah, again, uh, there are various processes responsible for uh, decreased performance or stability. And I uh, addressed only one of the thing is the halide ion migration. Uh, one of the ways to do it is uh, we know now that you cannot make the holes accumulate in the perovskite layer. That means they need to be taken away as quickly as they are formed. 
uh, to the whole transporting layer. So now the strategy for this one vary. Uh, people have used uh, triple cations, people have used the surface treatments with the more electron donors, uh, people have tried to uh, uh, remove the defects so that uh, this process suppress. So uh, once you know the cause of this one, now it is to find which way is better. So uh, right now, I don't have an answer for this, but all these different strategies are in play. I think the organic cations uh, uh, that I talked at the end, with the, what people call it as a 2D, uh, but essentially the organic cations uh, giving you that uh, layer uh, that it seems to be a, a more favorable approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, the, in the morning, morning session, Professor um, Kanachidis also mentioned about the, the mixture of 2D and 3D, the perovskite solar cell. And second question is, uh, what is the optimized thickness or ratio of each 2D and 3D perovskite to maximize the long-term stability? Yeah. Uh, Again, that is a very interesting paper. And what they started off with a putting a 2D layer on 3D. They never presented any data what happens after 2,000 hours. Did it remain still 2D or this cations migrate? All other studies show that these cations do migrate. You may be putting a 2D layer, but eventually these cations also migrate and they change the interface and so that needs to be studied uh, how it changes and actually we are looking into it uh, uh, so the second question was uh, uh, the, the ratio of each two okay three. ratio uh, again the ratio i think that chris barbeck's paper uh, what they did was they mixed different amounts and they found out that uh, that about 20 to 25 percent uh, Again, we have to look into the paper. Uh, adding that one into the uh, 3D perovskites, that gave them the best performance. Uh, so uh, there is an optimization process necessary. And same way that controlling the thickness of electron transport layer and a whole transport layer is also equally important because that's what you're driving uh, for, uh, for this uh, process. Okay, and uh, this is my uh, question, personal question. Then uh, in the morning session also, uh, Professor uh, Kanachi this mentioned the 2D, the perovskite orientation can affect the moisture stability. So uh, I'm wondering yeah, uh, again, uh, uh, mechanism, yes. Yeah, uh, the, the, the fact is that, yes, you know, when people put 2D layer, they do see a better performance, better moisture resistance, because it is more organic than the 3D phase. So being more organic, they are more hydrophobic and they are trying to give you that protection. But my question was, does it remain as a 2D? Or is it a totally different composition, right? So we need to understand what is that one is working. It's okay, we put 2D layer, but after shining light, after subjecting to the increased temperature, uh, they start moving around and get a more stable phase. And now the question is, what is that stable phase? I see, I see. Okay, so excellent. Uh, thanks for your the great talk. And uh, let's thank the, the Professor Khamat again. Thank you very much. Thank you.